So this morning, um, if you have your Bible and want to turn with me, it's going to be from Luke 14, and it's going to be verses 16 through 23. So I'll give you a moment for that. And I'm reading from the uh, NIV version, so it may be a little different. But Luke 14, 16 through 23. It says, Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who, had inv who he had invited to come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant. He said, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be fit full. Okay, so this is a parable. And most of us are... Uh, un most of us understand that Jesus used parables to teach. So in today's society, a, par a parable would be like God's way of a visual aid. So he used parables, miracles, signs, and wonders, and he used these various ways for the different understandings of the people that he was around. So that tells me that while we're ministering, we may have to alter our ways in order to be effective to who we are ministering to. Then let's return to the text, and he says, a certain man in the beginning, a certain man conducted and prepared a supper and invited many, right? So I put this into perspective and I said, you know, when you create a dinner or a banquet, a lot of time goes into that. It's not a, a sudden thing most times. There's the food preparation. And if it's going to be at your home, you're going to do an extra cleaning. You're going to do a little bit more sprucing. Don't play. Y'all know you put a little more work <laughs> when you know that you're going to have guests. So. I just wanted to know if I could use this analogy and compare it to Jesus. And might I say that like this man, Jesus has prepared a supper for us and invited us. Where's the invitation? Well, the invitation was back in Matthew 11, 28 through 29. It says, come ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the invitation. We have been invited. Say, I've been invited. I've been invited. Good. So I'm glad you got that. So there's a supper and you've been invited, right? But the question is, are we allowing the things in our lives to occupy us to the point that we're literally asking for removal from the master's table, like these people in the parable? So for a tough subject matter, I would like to talk about our business versus soul business. So let's go back to the text one more time. At 18 it says, but they alike all begin to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go see it, please excuse me. <clears throat> Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married and so I can't come. These are all excuses. Now, whether they're valid or not, they are still making excuses not to attend something that someone has put their effort into. God has put his effort into this dinner that he's invited us to. Are we so consumed with ourselves that we're allowing our business to distract us and ultimately leave the table? See there? At the table, there's deliverance, provision, and healing. There's also fresh direction and wisdom. So why would you leave the table? Why? Everything you need is there. Why would you leave? But are we honestly just too busy to spend time with God? Is that, the, is that what's happening? That we become so preoccupied with our own things that we don't even want to take that moment to sup with God. I thought, well, maybe it's because we haven't realized that dinner is more than just a meal. See, you must realize that dinner is more than just food. It's a time of relationship and fellowship. And how do I know that? Because most times when you eat with someone, you choose to eat with your friends, someone you know. There are those awkward times when you'll eat with a stranger, but you feel that first moment of awkwardness. So it's our usual desire to eat with our friends. Um, so, if we're leaving the table, there has to be a reason. So let's go back to why we're leaving the table. Maybe we're leaving the table because we've grown new relationships with new things 
and we rather entertain and fellowship with them. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me too. I get it. That's why things that concern him no longer concern us. Because we're out of relationship, we're out of fellowship. You know, things that concern him like souls. So our business has become more important than soul business. When at one time, soul business and our business were intertwined. They were one and the same. Our business has caused us to neglect his instructions, ultimately. I don't know if you guys were on the prayer call on Friday morning, and Pastor Brown was speaking about follow the instructions. And somewhere in between the instruction being given and our action, there is some kind of interference. And the interference is varied. It can be fear. It can be the fear of rejection. It can just be several different things. So let's go back to the instruction and figure out what that was. Well, a book before, he says, Mark 16, 15 through 16, he says, And he said unto them, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so that is to be a witness. So ultimately, we just must recommit ourselves back to the table where Jesus is and be about our Father's business, soul business. So if soul business is our business, how is business? <laughs>
Everybody understand it? There between congregation and uh, Episcopal. Okay. Right. But uh, Bishop of Justice Bowen in High Springs, Arkansas, uh, he established the Church of God in Christ Congregation. Now, the thing about that was in 1932. And in 1946, the Church of God in Christ leaders called him back because he was one of the founders, uh, one of the leaders, one of the main leaders in Arkansas and uh, across the United States as well. But uh, they called him back. And so he came back to the Church of God in Christ Incorporated in 1946. He came back to the Church of God in Christ Incorporated. And therefore, he left Bishop George W. Slack in charge of Church of God in Christ Congregation. Okay. But Bishop Justice Bowe came back to the Church of God in Christ in 1946. Okay. Uh, 1936, uh, Bishop Mason's second wife, Leela Mason, uh, she passes. And that's who all he, he had all his children by her. He didn't have the children by the first wife or the, second, or the third wife. All the children were by the second wife, Leela Mason. Uh, 1945, our national supervisor, which was uh, changed, remember, it was the Overseers of Women's Work was the title. Uh, our national supervisor, the change the national supervisor was Mother Elizabeth Woods Robertson. She enters the turn of rest in 1945. Uh, we'll be discussing her also uh, at the end of the uh, lesson and also um, for March because March is Women's History Month. So I'm going to go over the women supervisors uh, uh, for uh, Women's History Month. But she passes away in 1945, and Mother Lillian Brooks Coffey becomes the National Supervisor of Women. Uh, she, she takes her place, uh, and I, I think I told you before, Bishop Mason was looking for a women's supervisor. He wanted Mother Coffey first. He wanted her first, but she said, you need a more seasoned woman, an older, no, older woman. And that was Mother Robinson, and so he, he chose Mother Robinson. Is there a relationship there with the second presiding Bishop Brooks and this lady? The what now? You know, Bishop Brooks. Oh, Bishop Brooks. Is there, is there a relationship there? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I have to look that up. I'm not. I, I, as far as I know, I don't. I don't think it is. But I never noticed that. I didn't have noticed that yet. Uh, Bishop Brooks is our uh, uh, first assistant to the presiding bishop, Bishop Blake, and he was saying was there any relation between Bishop Brooks out of Michigan and Mother Lily Brooks Coffee, since they had the same last name, Brooks. I'm not sure. But I have to look that up. That's, that's good. I, I never noticed that before. So I have to look that up. Mm -hmm. But I know Mother Coffee was also, uh, she was an overseer of women's work here in Georgia. And one of her first assignments was here in Georgia as well. Okay. Mother Coffee. Mm -hmm. right. uh, 1946, we have Bishop L.C. Patrick. He organized the first Sunday school convention. The first Sunday school convention. And remember, our convention was separate. Our convention was separate. Sunday school, YPWW, all those were separate. So Bishop, 1946, Bishop Patrick organized the first Sunday School Convention. Okay. 1949, we have another split. 1949, Bishop Randolph A. Carr leaves Coaching Incorporated under Bishop Mason and forms Church of God in Christ, Jesus Apostolic. Oh, my God. Oh, and let me tell you why. Most This separation was because most of these churches were in the Caribbean, Trinidad, Jamaica, Around that, around that area, where it's sort of like, you remember reading about the, the American Revolution, Britain and the United States, the colonies? Yeah. Well, they're so far away, you know, we were so far away from them, and we didn't have a, pre, a strong presence. So they decided, they decided, well, you know, you're not down here, you know, and why are we taking orders from uh, Memphis when we're all the way down here in Jamaica or Trinidad? So we need to form our own organization, basically, to do the distance and logistics. So they decided to form Church of God in Christ, Jesus Apostolic. Oh, I tell you, Jesus Apostolic. Why does keep it coming? It is, it is coming. It's Coach J.A. <laughs> Coach J.A., Jesus Apostolic. Right. It's still Coach. It's Coach J.A. Okay? And then you know the reason that, right? Uh, like uh, trademarks, you got to change, you know, you can't, they can't be Church of God in Christ Incorporated, so they have to change just a little bit of it to make it theirs. And that's with anything when we deal with, with patent and trademarks. Like uh, even with chemicals, if you just put one element in the chemical that's different, you can claim it as something else. You can claim it as yours. Even though you got all the basic elements that the other chemical had, you just put, maybe you put salt in it, it still changes, so you can you still get a, a patent for yourself on it. Even though, like I said, the basics uh, is that original chemical. So they keep the basic Church of God of Christ name. They just change it, Jesus Apostolic, Congregational, and then we'll see more later. Later. Okay? 
But uh, he formed Church of God in Christ, Jesus Apostolic. And like I say, most of those churches are like in the Caribbean and Jamaica. Okay? 1952, uh, we have a pivotal year here because Bishop Mason, he's running the church. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the administration, a lot of the organization is on him. It's like a one-man kind of uh, uh, organization because everything comes to him. So he decides uh, that he's going to relieve some of the pressure on him. So what he does, what he appoints Bishop A.B. McEwen out of Tennessee, John Seth Bailey out of Michigan, uh, Owen Kelly out of New York, and he points them out on his uh, executive commission. And they were to oversee the administration of the church. So he, like I say, he can't do everything by himself. So he appoints a commission to help him organize and administrate, do administration in the church. And like I say, those were the first three bishops on the executive commission. So, and keep that in mind because uh, it's going to come up a question of when Bishop Mason dies on where the power and authority of the Church of God in Christ lies. So, the power and authority of the Church of God in Christ leadership, as written in the amended constitution in 1952, and I had the, uh, this is the one in 73, uh, the manual in 73, and I showed you the old one I had in 41, 44, where there was another manual which I can't find, it's a blue one, and that, that was the one in 52, which changed the constitution. So we had three manuals. Uh, the old one I told you in 44, the one in 52 here, which is blue, and then the one in 73, which I got here. So we had three manuals. And basically, um, that manual changed the Constitution and said if Bishop Mason dies, the power and authority of the Church of God in Christ will revert back to the Board of Bishops. Now, who's the Board of Bishops? That's all the state bishops, jurisdictional bishops. Uh, that's the Board of Bishops. They're on the Board of Bishops. But that was the uh, prerequisite. In case he died, the power would go back to the Board of Bishops. Everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. 1953, uh, Bishop Mason was thought, was thought to be 90 years old, as Fifth Street in Memphis would rename him to Mason Street in his honor. Uh, that's if his birthday, birthday was 1862. And like I said, that was one of the dates uh, I had mentioned. And that's also the date on his obituary. He was born September 8, 1862 on his obituary. Okay. But they renamed uh, Fifth Street in his honor, uh, called it Mason Street. Okay. Uh, 1961, Senior Bishop Mason passes away in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, the funeral was at Mason Temple, of course. And it was a five hour service held on November 25th. And his body was laid in state in the lobby of Mason Temple. What was the five hour service? It's a funeral, a five hour service. Yeah. And that's short compared to what I saw with Coretta Scott King and uh, Rosa Parks. I think that was about eight or nine hours. <laughs> so that's sort of short. Huh? Really? Yeah. Yeah, because they didn't get to the uh, grave site for Coretta Scott King until about nine or ten at night. Yeah. What they was doing? They had everybody talking. <laughs> uh, Malcolm X's daughter talked for about an hour and a half. Just so. That was you just talking, you know. Just doing words you like, like you do expressions at the funeral. <laughs> and then you had the president. Yeah. <laughs> 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 two minutes, two minutes. No, they didn't. They went over two minutes. <laughs> everybody, everybody went over two minutes uh, at the funeral. So, but yeah, it was five hours, and you know, Bishop Mason, you had all these bishops, and mm -hmm. you know, and superintendents, the elders, missionaries. So you know, it, it tend to be long. Mm -hmm. Tend to be long. My my pastor's mother's funeral was from twelve o'clock to about six o'clock. That's, that was, I remember that was in Wheatley, Arkansas. Yeah. So it was a long one too. And all, she had 17 kids and about 15 of them were preachers. So, <laughs> so, 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 so the fuels can get long. <laughs> they can get long. Okay? So, uh, his obituary says, like I said, he was born September 1862. Uh, his children, children of Bishop Mason, um, and with Leela Washington Mason, was, he had Alice Mason. Uh, and I believe, I'm, I'm trying to uh, verify, I think she was one that married a CME bishop as well. CME, a Christian Methodist Episcopal uh, bishop. Because Bishop Mason had a relationship with a lot of the CME uh, people because a lot of them came over to Church of God in Christ. A lot of them came over to Church of God in Christ. And that was uh, sort of like a chagrin to me when I was growing up because when, they, when I was growing up, uh, they told us, you know, we could marry Baptists or Methodists. You had to marry within the Church of God in Christ. <laughs> Uh, anybody else remember that? I guess I'm on the old school. You remember that too? Okay. 
Don't make me look like I'm crazy. <laughs> I'm from Mississippi, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, they, 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 you didn't marry outside church got a Christ. Right. You married, you didn't marry, plus you didn't marry Baptist. You definitely didn't marry Baptist. You stayed within the church got a Christ. So I was just surprised his daughter married a CME bishop. Um, so he had Alice Mason. He had Mary Esther Mason who wrote a biography for him about 1927. Uh, she dies in 1932. Okay. He had Leela Mason Bias. Uh, his other daughter, uh, she was the one who testified that he was born September 8, 1863. That was her uh, knowledge that uh, he had born 1863 instead of 1862. Okay. Uh, he had Charles Harrison Mason Jr. Uh, his nickname was Bob or Robert Mason. Uh, he mysteriously got killed in 1968. Uh, Charles Harrison Mason Jr. Then he had Deborah Mason Patterson who was the wife of Bishop J.O. Patterson, who was the first presiding bishop in the Church of God in Christ. She marries him, and she dies in 1984, Deborah Mason Patterson. Okay. He had Julia Mason Atkins, and he also had Ruth Mason, which was the last living child. She just died in last year, 2015. Ruth, she was on the Sunday School book. I don't know if you remember. She was on the Sunday School. She was the last living child of Bishop Mason, and she died passing away in 2015, last year. He had a son, Arthur Frederick Mason. Uh, too much, I didn't know too much about him, because um, they really said he wasn't really uh, in the church. Uh, he and mostly was you know, uh, of uh, alcohol substance and stuff like that. Um, and then there was Israel Mason, who was named not his half brother, Israel Nelson. He was born, he was still born. He, you know, he died uh, in the birth process. Okay. So those were the children of uh, Bishop Mason and Leila Washington. Any questions about the children? Yes, uh-huh. His first wife's name was what? Uh, Alice Sexton. And his child's name was Which one? Oh, yeah. He, yeah, he does a lot of, there's a lot of repeat of names. Okay. Uh, especially named a lot of them out to his brothers and sisters, too. Like Israel is his uh, half-brother. Okay. Yeah, and uh, Mary was his sister, too. And Robert was his brother, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they do a lot of repeat, and and well, that, that's a tradition in African American community because, like, my name Ovel is also my uncle's name, and also my great uncle's friend. So, and they did that because you recognize family. You if I see somebody named Ovel, I know they probably my family. So you use that name uh, recognition, like, say, you get separated, or you know, pe people go away, and don't come back, you know. And you find them, and you have, they have a name, and you can hook, hook up to that name and say, okay, you must be family because your name Oville. You know? So that's why they did it. Uh -huh. I, I think that's Jermaine Arkansas. No, no. <laughs> no, it's, it's really, like I say, the African American tradition is well, when uh, slaves were being sold away and leaving family, so they would name them to know they have a family connection. So they recognize that family name. Not Jermaine Arkansas. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I mean, I understand. I was just like, okay, was the wife okay with you naming our child after your first wife? First wife. Oh, yeah. oh. Uh, well, I guess you would. I'm <laughs> 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 sorry, that wife. <laughs> well, I guess you would. I mean, it wasn't, you know. <laughs> and it could have been just Alice, it could have been a nice name. <laughs> let's, let's go with that. <laughs> this could have been a nice name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Did, did he marry her niece? No, that was Mi that was No, oh, that was uh, Elsa. That was the third wife, Elsa. Yeah, Elsa. His first wife was Alice. His and first wife was Alice, Alice Sexton. And the second was Leela. And the second was Leela. And, and then the, the last one was Elsie. 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 Yeah. That was niece and aunt. Right. right. Yeah. Everybody got it? Everybody got it? <laughs> All right. Okay, um, next one is Mother Elizabeth Woods Robinson. <coughs> oh, yeah, I hate to say it, but where was she born? Arkansas. Oh, <laughs> hey, I didn't make it up. That's where she was born. <laughs> she was born in 1860 in Phillips County, Arkansas. Um, the hometown may have been Helen. I'm trying to look up Helena Records because that's where I'm from and see if I can find a record of her being there. Uh, the reason they say Phillips County is because well, if you were born like 1860, uh, especially in the South, they didn't have towns yet. A lot of towns came after the Civil War. 
like especially my town of Barton, when I, when I went to high school, they, they didn't come, they developed it after the Civil War. So they would give you a county where you were born instead of being a, a city or a town. So that's the difference. Okay? And uh, she was married three times also. And uh, I don't know, I don't, I'm don't finding never that she killed her husband saying that. But uh, she was married three times. All the husbands died. All the husbands died. Yes. Hold on. Huh? Uh, no, I think the other one's in, uh, they went to Tennessee. Yeah, in Tennessee. Because mm -hmm. he moves to Tennessee, that's why he pastors churches in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And um, Mother Robin, she was married three times also, and uh, all, you know, three of her husbands died as well. Um, especially her last husband, Elder Robertson, and he preceded her in death. Okay. Um, Mother Robinson was under the tutelage of Joanna P. Moore. Uh, she was a white Presbyterian uh, a member who turned Baptist. And she formed a group called Bible Band, an organization called Bible Band. And that was for uh, the women, and mainly it was for the women to learn how to read. And they learned how to read the Bible and interpret the Bible. And it, like I say, it was a good tool for women to get together, read the Bible, and interpret the Bible as well. Okay? And so she established a prayer and Bible band. And Mother Robinson took that idea and brought it to the Church of God in Christ. And then she established a prayer and Bible band in the Church of God in Christ. Joanna P. Moore was significant. Also, she did it with the uh, National Baptist Convention as well. She sent a prayer and Bible band to the National Baptist Convention and to the Church of God in Christ. She was instrumental in doing it, both. Okay? But like I say, that's where a lot of the women learn how to read. And uh, that's why you get a lot of preachers when they uh, preach in the old days. They read on. Read on. What we call the read-on messages. Because a lot of preachers can read. The women too. <coughs> and so they can read the Bible and he can uh, express it in doing his preaching. Oh, yeah. So that's why I say read. You know. Read. Yeah. Yeah. Read, the book. <laughs> yeah, read the book. So that's what prayer and Bible bands was help, uh, help uh, like I say, in literacy and uh, especially in the women. Uh, information of women and interpreting the Bible as well. Okay. Uh, she also founded a sewing circle, a sewing circle auxiliary. Uh, she was in force of modest dress and coaching, uh, no wearing pants. And the sewing circle was developed so that women, women could turn their pants into dresses. <laughs> don't laugh, don't laugh. Don't laugh. <laughs> so the sewing circle, like so. You know, so you're able to turn your pants into dresses. Okay. It's real strict here. Okay. So. Not no Yeah, turn the pants, dresses. Also, there was no makeup, no wearing of makeup. Uh, your dress had to come down and cover your ankles. All the way to the floor. All the way to the floor. Yes. Well, this is Mother Robinson and her. Right, this is Mother Robinson. She's the lead over the National Supervisors. And what happens is, is that during this time is about the, um, looking at about the 1930s, 1940s, and, uh, and also in the 1920s, she wanted to put a difference between holy and unholy. Okay. So she's shunning any worldly influence. And like I say, again, during this time, okay, <laughs> during this time, this is what's happening during this time. Because like I say, during this time, you also have the age of the new modern woman uh, with the bob and the short headdress and the club hopping and the, and the, you know, and all the jazz age and stuff. So she's going against that age, and she's doing a backlash with the no makeup, no wearing pants, uh, gaudy hats, you know, remember the hats with the feathers and the plume and all that stuff? No, no one, that's because she don't want you to look like the club members. Well, at that time, the 20s, 30s, 20s, 20, 30s and 40s, yeah. Women always wore dresses and hats. They wore house dresses and hats. They didn't wear their pants back then. So was she not being kind of maybe extreme with it? Or Wait, well, no, I, th I think uh, it's like she's looking at the, uh, like, say, the club era, uh, the 1920s, the club hoppers and stuff like that. When they, you know, when they were wearing the dresses uh, above the knee and everything like that, she's looking at that, and she don't want you to be worldly. That's what, that's what her purpose was, is not to be worldly. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and it probably, right, I, I know looking in our eyes, it probably was a stream. Like, like not drinking Coca Cola was extreme. Yeah, yeah they said not drinking Coca Cola. But what Coca Cola came right then? Cocaine. Real cocaine. <laughs> that was extreme, but it was a good thing, right? Because it contained real cocaine. <laughs> right? 
There was no drinking Coca Cola, and also some of them had no not drinking tea as well because it was strong drink. We consider strong drink. And they had Bible for it, you know, wine is a marker, strong drink is raisin, who is seemed out is not wise. And the pants is, you know the scripture of the pants, right? Deuteronomy 22 and 5, a man should not wear anything pertaining to a woman, neither one wear anything pertaining to a man. You know those that's scriptures? my pants, that's material. But I'm just saying, that's the scripture they used to right. preach it on. Right. Right. I know, I know. <laughs> right. I, I know, I, I know. I'm just saying, the, I'm just giving you what happened right. back then. Right, what happened. They use that. Right, right. Not only is there kind of thing that oh. is going on in the congregation or now mm. that they, uh -huh. in this era, they're just getting away from. For away from, okay. Because okay. when I came up in that church in the 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s, we were restricted from a lot of stuff right. that don't really make sense right. now, exactly. even the color of red. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. exactly. Just like they used say. to sing that song, if it wasn't for the grease and the straight the comb, the never had women had to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't want. Right, you didn't want to stay. A lot of them believe you straight the comb, right? Exactly. Well, right. Let me, uh, let me get, uh, then I'll get you. Um, can tell what you just said. <laughs> but when you was growing up, when you was growing up. Oh, when I first came. He spoke on the congregational church mm. that broke off from the Church of God in Christ. In, well, they still teach us that about the pants, mm. the makeup. Right. They're just in this era in the 20th century, I'll say within the last five years, getting, getting away, away from, from that. that. Because uh, when I came up in there, we were restricted from certain colors. Right. Exactly. Not only the hat being flashy. Right. But they was telling us we couldn't even wear short sleeves exactly. or both Same sleeves. Uh -huh. Right. Because they would the women the mother would teach the women how to conduct ourselves around the brothers because a lot of the brothers weren't strong and they look at certain parts right. of a woman's body. That was the reason, yeah. You're right. Yeah, she's right. right. She's telling the truth. She's telling the truth, yeah. So that's, that's... this is how we were taught to cover right. ourselves right. that we won't be a hindrance to right. the brother, which the brother the one needed to pray. Right. <laughs> but but this is how we was taught to carry ourselves. Right. And it sticks in you, you know, and so gradually the Lord would have to teach you and bring mm -hmm. you out of that because it's really man doctrine. Right. Exactly. But right. It, it wasn't so much as to keep us in bondage, but it's to help. Right. That the brothers can stay safe. Mm -hmm. Because they couldn't stand to look at the knees, some can't stand to look at toes. You know, we couldn't wear open toe shoes. Couldn't wear open toe shoes. Yeah, I was gonna because get that. Of the weak brothers. Like Muslims when they go to prayer, the men are the ones in the back. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why now they cover their knees instead of wearing skirts long enough to cover their knees. They still flashy and have to wear makeup. And we had Sister Ruth. So yeah, I came up in that era. Okay, yeah, yeah. Very, very young don't make y'all don't y'all don't make me look crazy like I'm no one that came up in this era. Very young, young pride. Right. No yeah. makeup, no perfume, right. no nothing. Right. My hair was in a bun every day. Right. My shirt was up to here. My dress was down to right. the ankle. Okay. Every day, that's how you dress. I just want to witness. I just want to witness. Couldn't do any stockings every day. Yeah. That's why he's singing the choir, praise the Lord. Y'all still wear stockings. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just playing. I'm just but, uh, but, oh, okay. yeah. I had a question, really. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was yeah. just wondering, because uh -huh. that scripture, there uh -huh. were no pants when that scripture was Right, written. right. So right. did right. anybody bother to look into that? Right. Well, see, uh, again, 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 as I was saying, the time, the average person only graduated maybe one in ten people graduated oh. high school. So you didn't really have a high educational standard. And you got, you, you, you went on what you do. I got you. And Mother Robinson, Bishop Mason, all of them went on what they knew. And, and, like I say, and I think Bishop Mason had a third grade education. Okay. And so, so they went on what they knew and the best they knew how. And that's what they did during this time. Yes. And like I say, I think we... When we look on it, yes, it was extreme to us, but to them it might not have been that extreme because they, they felt, you know, that it was truly given to them and they were trying to make everything uh, different from the world. Okay. And that's what they wanted to do. And that was their purpose. So, like I say, now we see it, now we see more education, like you said, more scripture, and we know more scriptures that, that 
they wore robes instead of pants, you know, something like that. And that day, so that's what we get. That's what now, we get. Now. I, uh, part of my ancestry is mm -hmm. Quaker. Quakers, okay. And it's the same. Mm -hmm. So it kind of runs, ran through, and back in that period, back. you know, yeah. way back. Mm -hmm. And so all of that sort of Puritan value, mm -hmm. you know, kind of ran through right. the, the church at that point. Right. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, trying to. Mm -hmm. It was all about the morals and your morals, morals right. and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Smith. I just want to say you're not crazy. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Like right. My mother came back to the church, you know, they would tell her, you have to get your children out of pants. Mm -hmm. and so we would wear the long skirts to school and everything. We took gym, we had to wear shorts up under our skirts. Right. right. I remember so, that. <laughs> right. I remember. And the legend also, one of the minister elders uh, I was talking to in church. He said, Ruth, uh, Mr. Mason's, uh, the last girl that just died, she said she don't know where this idea of not wearing pants come from because she said, Bishop Mason had them wearing pants. What? <laughs> yeah, that's what she said. It's that's right, too. She said she had, Bishop Mason had them wearing pants. So. Really? Yeah. That was said, Ruth. Yeah, Ruth. Uh -huh. So, and, uh, but to that, like I say, uh, like Mother was saying, y'all didn't want to know me back then because I sent you to hell for wearing pants, wearing red. <laughs> Lipstick, makeup, I sent your hair for doing everything. <laughs> so, you not want to know me back then. <laughs> when did you get the number? Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, that's what we were taught. And I, like I said, I couldn't play basketball. I couldn't play football. You know. We couldn't even go to Couldn't even go to football games. Couldn't, yeah, couldn't even go to the games. And most of the games on Friday night, you had church on Friday night. Mm -hmm. yeah, so y'all did not want to know me back then. I'm more liberal now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's see. Mother Robs, okay. We had uh, dress come down below, and that's what I got. And no wearing gaudy colors, gaudy hats, like the club hoppers. Uh, Mother Robs is also a great revivalist, and she was a great preacher, according to Bishop Robert E. Hart. He came over from the CME as well. He was Bishop Mason's lawyer during the court case. Remember, I said 1907? In the court case, he was one of Bishop Mason's lawyers. Now, he became a lawyer in six months. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah, the time again, the time. This is early 20s and, and early teens. So we're looking at what we're looking at here. To be a lawyer back then, all you had to do, read some federal law books, preferably federal and state law, sit under the tutelage of a lawyer for six months, and bam, you're a lawyer. That's all you had to do. Now, would that fly now? No. <laughs> you got past bar and phone bar. <laughs> But back then, that's all you needed to be a lawyer. Amazing. And so he was one of Bishop Mason's lawyers. Uh, however, Mother Robson and R.E. Hart, Bishop Hart, has come to women teaching instead of preaching. So they would not upset the core male preachers. And I had experience with that up in Connecticut when I was up in uh, Beulah Church of God in Christ. Up in Connecticut, uh, I was on the Elder Lewis and uh, Superintendent Holden, who became a bishop in Massachusetts, Ivory Holden. And Sister Gilliard, Missionary Gilliard, Spoke in the pulpit, and so you know she was preaching, and well, I thought she was preaching anyway, and she was giving the word. So they had me in the house, words after her, and so I got up and said, "Oh man, Missionary Gary, she really preached us the word today." And Superintendent Luda and uh, Superintendent Holder said, "Women well, we don't preach this, sir. They teach." <laughs> and so I had to back down and say, "Well, that what she did, which I can't call preaching, she did it well." <laughs> I have a smart mouth on me then, so. <laughs> well, I said, well, that what she did with what I can't call preaching. She did it very well, and Lord blessed. <laughs> but that was the general idea that women didn't preach, they teach, or talk, they talk. But they, but they still feel the same way today. And um, that's, that's crazy to me. Right, you know, right. God called not just men, but he called women to preach too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And now, the thing is that, yeah, <laughs> uh, according to the manual, <laughs> according to the manual, that's the standard that women can be, cannot be elders, pastors. But it doesn't say that women can preach though in the manual. It doesn't say that. It just says they can't be pastors, elders, bishops, superintendents, but that's stuff like that. In the manual, right? In a man-made manual. Right, right. Well, yeah. I understand, I understand. And, 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 and what I'm saying, like, I'm just like saying, again, I'm not going to get, in, I can't get into the theology of women preaching, 
but I just want to stick with the history of, of what we've done over time. But yeah, I understand. I understand. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. A very good point. And to change that, you know, uh, to change the manual or change uh, women being um, pastors and elders, well, you had you had to go through the general assembly. That was, that's, it. that's the protocol. You got to go through the general assembly and, uh, and have to be brought up in the assembly and voted on. Don't you need to rally up some people? <laughs> well, I said. They've been they've been talking about that, but like I said, nothing ever has happened. Uh, even at ITC when I was over there, they were talking about it. But like I said, nothing has never nothing has ever you know transpired. Because basically. there's ways around it without going through all that. Right. There are women pastors now. Right, no. but I, right, so, right. But I guarantee you, when they get to the general assembly, they're not pastors. There's something else. I guarantee that. That's what I'm saying. I'm just saying. I mean, <laughs> right. I mean, if, you, if you're at your local church and you're running your local church as the mm -hmm. pastor, why go through all that? Yeah. Well, but I'm saying if, if uh, to change that, uh, you have, what I'm saying is you need the votes in the general assembly, right. basically. That's what I'm saying. Right, and that's to why change. the women, mm -hmm. I mean, the pastors, the women pastors, they why go through that? Because they know it's a lot of work. When you right, but if you want it, I mean, that's. When you know, you're already a right. pastor at your local church, then why go through all of that? Right, right but if you want change, though, that's right. what I'm right. saying. Okay. So you're yeah, not talking process. history now. You're talking now yeah, right. that, there, that women cannot be considered pastors. Right, right. According to the manual. <laughs> In this manual, women cannot be pastors, <laughs> elders, bishops? bishops, or superintendents. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the Church of God in Christ. In the Church of God in Christ. Yeah. I, uh, I came from the Anglican Episcopal Church thing. Mm -hmm. And that broke our church up in the, uh, in the 80s because mm -hmm. uh, the women wanted to be ordained. Right. And it split the Episcopal Church. It, it crumbled. Mm -hmm. And uh, they just, uh, it just crumbled. The church just crumbled again because they, uh, uh, there's a gay bishop now. Mm -hmm. So it just continues in whatever religion you're in. There's going to always be that power and control and moral issue. And mm -hmm. it's not just this right. denomination. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. And I'm just saying that the channels that, uh, that have been set forth in the Church of God in Christ is the General Assembly, and the women can vote if they have enough votes and overturn that. That's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. So is it moving that direction? Uh, not that I can see. From what I witnessed, I haven't seen it because they haven't come up in the General Assembly that I've been in. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it ain't. I mean, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but if the women get the you know get together yeah. and get it rolling, it possibly could. Is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. No. Nah. <laughs> it pops a good if you get the rolling. It pops a good if you get the vote. Yes, Ms. Smith. Well, the women, if you go to general assembly, what it, um, uh, women can be lay members as the representatives of uh, you got all the bishops can vote, all the elders, all the superintendents, all the pastors, uh, all like I say, not below elder ministers and deacons can't vote. But in the general assembly, you can have lay men, women can be lay members. There's five missionaries from each jurisdiction, the state jurisdiction where we in. You get five missionaries from there. You get bishops wives, they can vote. And all the supervisors, the, women, the state supervisors of women, they can also vote as well. Okay, my question was, uh -huh. is there anybody now that is considered a pastor in COVID? Yes, that's two, that's two women pastors in our jurisdiction here in South Central Georgia. Right. But when they go to the General Assembly, Right, they're probably as, as a, either a lay delegate or a missionary. <coughs> See what I'm saying? <laughs> because, again, you have to change the manual. Right. You have to change the manual. Right, because you have to, like I say, it's a, it's a process. And I say, you get the ball and you get enough people behind it to change it, I more likely to change. Right, right. Yeah, I know a lot of women pastors, yeah. Yeah, they, I, they carry the title pastor. I know a lot of women, but like I say, in general yeah. Simmons, <laughs> right, in general Simmons, is they, they they get a, uh, another representation. If they go to seminary? Yes, a lot of pastors go to IT. I've seen uh, some women go to ITC as well. So they, but they can't be a dame. That's the problem. They get the degree. <laughs> right. And they can preach. Right. And they can be called pastors. Mm -hmm. Right. They but they can't be a yeah, they they be, that's it. Right, that's it. So. And they can send their money to the National Church. Right, they can send their money to National Church. But in, in it, everybody, wait a minute, everybody in General Assembly got to send their money to National Church, me included. So everybody got to pay the report. So. Well, your report is 
board is just as a general assemblyman, not as a pastor. You <coughs> right. Your money exactly. Your pastor, you're right. Not exactly. Your exactly. Exactly. Okay. But don't they still require that 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 church body to send the same report as as, as a church body? That pastor is still has to represent that church body. It's not necessarily. Like, no, no, all so of the lay members just have to represent. So if I'm a, so yeah. if I'm a so if I'm a, a female pastor, mm -hmm. I don't report as a female pastor. I report as a missionary. As probably as a missionary. Mm -hmm. More or or a lay member. Or a lay member. Or a lay member. Yeah. Yeah. They won't. They're not going to accept. They won't accept that. Just like pastors do with me. Uh -huh. I, I'll give a report to our local church. local church, right? As an ordained reverend, but anywhere beyond these walls, mm -hmm. I'm just like everybody else. And they won't acknowledge that. No, me too. No. Me too. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm just messing with you. you I mean, I'm not saying that. Right. I'm, I'm going to get you out the <laughs> But what I'm saying is, uh, the report, it don't matter. Male or female report, it don't matter. I mean, it's, you know, they want, they want the money. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So we're all a subject unto the money. I wish I could pay less. I wish I could pay some. They know. <laughs> Like, I pay that, what is it, $200? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, you but yeah, the report, you no. Know. And like I say, you can't vote, whether you're male or female, you can't vote in the General Assembly unless you pay the report. So, so that, 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 that might deter a lot of people too, so. <laughs> okay, where we stop at? Uh, Ari Hart, women teaching and preaching, okay. Okay, several auxiliaries. Did, did, I, did I miss it? Did I miss it? Okay. Several auxiliaries and separate conventions, okay. Uh, we had Sunday school, uh, YPWW, Young People Willing Workers, yeah. Prayer Bible Band, we just went over with Mother Robinson, Home and Foreign Mission, they all had separate conventions, separate <coughs> conventions. Um, all coach auxiliaries were united under the title UNAC, mm -hmm. United National Auxiliaries Convention or Conference in 1976, 1976. And that was done under the presiding bishop, first presiding bishop of our church, J. O. Patterson Sr. The reason I say first presiding bishop because Bishop Mason was senior bishop and O.T. Jones was senior bishop. We didn't have a presiding bishop until Gerald passed. That's, that's why I say first presiding bishop. Right. So he united all the auxiliaries under UNAC, UNAC in, uh, in 1976. Uh, after he dies in 1989, Bishop Ford takes over and he separates them again. Bishop Ford, L.H. Ford, uh, he separates them again. And then um, Bishop Owens took over after Bishop Ford died in 1995. And he brought them all back together. Instead, but instead of calling them UNAC, he called it AIM, Auxiliaries and Ministry. And that was in 1996. And that's where we are now. It's called AIM, Auxiliaries and Ministry. I think the convention's in Cincinnati this year? It is. Yeah. Cincinnati? Yeah, AIM Convention. Cincinnati this year. Okay. And uh, like I said, that was on the Bishop City, uh, Presiding Bishop, Channel David Owens. Okay. Uh, 1968, uh, Education. We established the C.H. Mason Seminary. Charles Hasselman Seminary, which is here in Atlanta, uh, in the, the Interdenominational Theological Center. Uh, dean Harold Bennett is the uh, dean of the school, and they established that in 1968. It was the idea formed under O.T. Jones, senior bishop, and it was completed under Bishop Gerald Patterson, senior. So there's a, uh, like I said, there's a seminary for uh, members of the Church of God in Christ, the Charles Hasselman Mason Seminary. Matter of fact, they're having a Founders uh, Week this week on the 25th. And they're having uh, some uh, speakers for some seminars, I think, uh, that Tuesday or Wednesday as well, if, if you want to get a chance to stop by there. So on, uh, between Morris Brown and Martin Luther King Drive, over there where Morehouse Spelman, all those colleges are over in that area. Okay. Uh, 1977, uh, Saints Academy closed. Um, closed, and uh, Bishop Ford reopened it for a little while, about 1993. 1994, uh, there was a school where I told you where uh, Dr. Mallory, where she was the president of in Lexington, Mississippi. Um, he opened it for a little while because he was a graduate of there, Bishop Ford was, and also I think one of the also went there as well. Um, but the school now is currently closed. As of now, it's currently closed. Where is it at? Lexington, Mississippi, Saints Academy. It's currently closed now. Okay. But those are some of the different schools uh, that the uh, Church of God in Christ have. Yes. What happened to that university? Remember we were selling that lotion for years? Uh, what? That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> You've been, been talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bad question? 
you okay. Let me tell you. Well, hold on. Let me let me get to the story. <laughs> okay. What she what she's talking about is um. um <laughs> what she talking about is All Saints University. Um, back about 1982 to about 1986, Bishop Patterson and the church had put out they were going to create All Saints University in Memphis. And I had looked at it because I was planning on going. I was in high school then. I was in uh, about the 11th grade. So this is about, like I say, around the 19, uh, mid 80s. And it was supposed to be completed by 1985, 1986. So like she said, we were selling lotion. We were doing revivals and we were taking up money for it. Mosquitoes biting us under your tents and stuff like that. But <laughs> then Ella Humphreys testified that he was in Germany. He was sending money from Germany for the school. And then you had people all around, just all around the country, uh, for Church of God of Christ, was sending money to build the school. Yeah. Now, I should know something was wrong because, you know, I'm near the Memphis area. I used to go there well, from Arkansas. I used to go to Memphis all the time. And the, they supposed to build it over there by the Chisco Hotel. But I never saw any groundbreaking. I never saw any bulldozers. I never saw any, <laughs> any construction equipment <laughs> going on. So they gathered all this money. And I was planning on going to school. I, I'm a junior now, so and then I'm, you know, I'm going to my senior year, and I don't see a school being built. So I'm like, okay, how am I gonna go to the school? So what happened was, the, I asked about school like my senior year, and they had uh, at that time they had scratched all the plans, but nobody knew what happened to all the money. Mm -hmm. From reports I've been getting and research I've been doing, co the collection, the what now? The what? No, I, no, 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 not that. Allegedly. <laughs> but some of the resources and some of the people that I talked to who worked on the project, they said they estimate they collected about $144 million. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's their estimates. It could be high, it could be low. I don't know. It's just an estimate. Wait, hold on. Yes. The Church of God in Christ Incorporated. Yes. Under the leadership of J.O. Patterson. J.O. See. They collected. The. Well, estimated. estimated allegedly that some of the people that worked with the project uh -huh. and some of the people that were in, you know, building, the, uh -huh. putting up the diagrams for the university, uh -huh. estimated 144 million that they collected. And nothing else happened. See, what had happened was. Hold on, hold on. They said some of the money was under the Bishop Ford regime, uh, under Bishop Ford, but they said it was only 4 million. And they couldn't account for the other 140 million. Wow. Anyway. So I'm um, like I say, it's not a joke. No. To this day, they don't know where that money is. Well, I just say we don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> they put it that way. They put it that way. <laughs> they put it that way. We, we don't know where it is. <laughs> we don't know where it is. <laughs> we don't know where it is. <laughs> so and so so the school never got built, basically. Uh, it never got built. <laughs> No, the school never got built. It was in the, like, 82, 82 to 86, somewhere around there, because they were advertising in the early 80s. So all those young kids who were, like, myself, who was in high school, we can go to the school. I said, okay, that'd be cool. I can go to All Saints University. It's just right down the road. I can drive there. I'm good. What they got to do with the lotion? Well, they were selling fundraisers. They were doing different oh, fundraisers. Oh. Like, they were doing lotion. Boxes. We were doing revivals. Boxes. Yeah, we were doing revivals. And, and everybody was giving during the revival, you know, uh, to fund the school. Because, you know, it was for our, our, our kids and everything. Well, for me, you know, I'm a kid then. So, so it was funding for the school. And so people had fundraisers all across the country. That was uh, under J.O. Patterson? Yes, yes. John John pulled the lotion up. <laughs> I don't remember the lotion. I didn't do the lotion. Actually, I remember the revival with the mosquitoes beating me up. <laughs> I don't remember the lotion. <laughs> Hold oh, no. <laughs> on, bro. Smell, bro. Smell. It's an island. <laughs> well, well. Again, they made. Um, they made. Um, he's out of Louisiana. The bishop out of Louisiana, uh, Wimbush. He was made president. I think president for life over the school. So I don't know if you know. If the money's still under him or not, I'm not sure. You need to check if he's driving a Lexus and leaving. <laughs> Come on now. Yeah. 
But like, see, that's just an estimate. That's just an estimate. So. That's a big estimate. And if you go on some of the old, uh, you might catch some of the old uh, sites or the Facebook page, you, you can see a diagram of the universe. I have one. I, uh, it's in my, in my files. They have the uh, architect drawings of the universe and everything. Real nice. It was real, it was real pretty. <laughs> it was looking good. <laughs> Had a dome on there and everything. It was, it was looking good. Yeah. But like I say, the school never got built. The school never got built. So, oh, this took place after. Um, this took place in the 80s. Yeah. About yes. This, uh, like I say, from 80, about 80s, 82 to 86. Okay. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> okay. So we got Saints Academy and uh, we had All Saints University, but like I say, which never came to fruition. Okay. Uh, if you look at the bottom, that's our Kojic seal. It was created in 1973. Uh, before 73, they just had, you know, uh, church, they just had a blank a seal with Church of God in Christ founded and it said 1896 on the seal. Um, but it was adopted by the General Assembly. Like I said, we have to go through the General Assembly for everything in 1981. So it formed and uh, created in 73 and adopted by the General Assembly in 1981. What are you showing, man? It's Kojic lotion. Oh. <laughs> like I, said, I don't remember the lotion. I don't remember the lotion. Okay. Uh, and the Kojic seal of the wheat represents the people of the Church of God in Christ. Uh, the rope tie of the wheat uh, is two meanings uh, Bishop Mason and ancestors or the word of God. And the rain is the latter rain of the end times or the latter rain of the Holy Ghost. That's our seal. You, you should see it on the pulpit, the uh, Kojic seal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our Kojic seal. Also, we have a Kojic anthem. What's our anthem? Yes, 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 yes Lord. Lord. No, yes, Lord. No, yes, Lord. <laughs> What'd you say? Uh, this is the church again. No, that's not the anthem. I know that song, but it's not the anthem. Yes, Lord is the anthem. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Which we uh, are. We don't have to sing that anymore. We sing that all the time. Can you enlighten us on wheat? Oh, the wheat uh, represents the people of the Church of Christ. Why wheat? Um, I think they told it. Uh, yeah, you're dealing with the harvest. Uh, I know that by scripture said that the wheat and tare, the, uh, the wheat being the Christians and the tare being the non-Christians, let them grow together. So the wheat represents the saints. It represents the saints in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And also, I think uh, since we have uh, since this is in the south, we have a southern background. <laughs> as well, <laughs> as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that's the seal. Uh, any questions about the seal? Uh, and it just got the 1907 date on it when uh, uh, Mason won uh, the rights to the Church of God in Christ as well. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. Okay. What I do is um, I got one more thing. Um, uh, you have a paper due. So what I want you to do is um, in March. For the next session in March, I want you to write down the title for your paper. Yeah, I know y'all already done. Yeah. Huh? Well, those already done, then you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Write down your title for your paper. Now, done? let me give you a suggestion for it, though. This is one, it's one page. It's one page. Let me give you suggestions. Uh, what state are you from? Mississippi. You can do the history of the Church of God in Christ in Mississippi. See what I'm saying? Something like that. Everybody understand? <laughs> yeah. I didn't get the What's the assignment that's what I'm saying. Okay, this is one page paper, uh -huh. and I want you to bring your title to the March session, next March, which is next session. Just bring the title. Just bring the title. Yeah, don't write the paper. <laughs> Just bring the title. And what well, I was giving an example of, he's from Mississippi. He can do, I want him to do the history of Church of God in Christ in Mississippi. See what I'm saying? Something like that. Okay. You're so from. Do the Episcopal Church? No, well, it's got to be Church of God in Christ. So. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to not do a paper then. Well, where state you from? Where state you from? Texas. His, there's a lot of history of Church of God in Christ, Texas. So I want to do something about that. Yeah, Church of God in Christ, Texas. The assignment is history of this denomination in Texas. In Texas, yeah. Yeah, there you go. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in Texas. Mm -hmm. A whole lot. Well, ain't it funny? I had to move to Georgia to fight. Any other questions? Hey. Yeah, you can act down to a yeah. jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah, a jurisdiction. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like you're from? I'm from Michigan. Oh, you got a whole, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. Anybody have a problem with that state? You write about the lotion. Who? No. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can write about the lotion. That's a good topic. That's a good topic. That is. That's a good topic. Yeah, you can write about the lotion. Exactly. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's, yeah I, I, no, that's serious. I'm serious. How effective on Ash was it? 
Yeah, yeah. 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 That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's fine. Oh no, I'll just do it. He can do Texas no, because yeah. He can do Texas because they got many different jurisdictions. He can do different. Yeah. He can do something different. Yeah. Exactly. Because Texas is so big. <laughs> it's so big. <laughs> but yeah, your topic has to be about the Church of God in Christ, uh, Pentecostal, yeah, and Pentecostal. Everybody understand that? Okay. Any questions about if your your state? I know, Mother, you got Georgia, right? I know. You got Georgia, right? <laughs> okay. South Carolina? Okay, that's good. South Carolina is good. Yes. So is this going to be a paper for turning in or for oral delivery? Uh, turning in. Okay. Uh, in May. In May. That's why I want to get you started in March, and then you just have it completed by May. Okay. Yeah. And it's one page. It's one page. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Huh? Huh? Uh, we're gonna do it the last session in May. Yeah. You turn in the last session in May, and because uh, then I'm gonna just probably go. I'm gonna do like a picture of history and stuff like that on the last session. Yes. yes. Oh. Hold on, I can't hear. I can't hear. No, I want the states because what I'm doing is y'all actually helping me out a little bit here since I'm writing the history of Church of God in Christ. I haven't had a chance to write every state. Because people have been asking me about, uh, do you got this bishop? I say, hun, ma'am, he's not in the Georgia. So he's in Alabama. I didn't write the history of every state. So what y'all doing is help me write the history of the Church of God in Christ in every state. Okay. See what I'm doing? Uh -huh. See the method behind my madness? <laughs> Instead of me writing it by myself. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Because there's a lot of states with a lot of history. And I can't cover it all by myself. Teamwork, yes, teamwork, yes, exactly. So was it a lot in Alabama? Yes, oh yeah, Alabama's rich. I know. Mm, it's rich. Okay. Any questions about the paper? Any questions? Okay. If you have a problem, just uh, see me or give my number, you can call me. I can help you through and everything, okay? Okay, okay, very good. Okay, yeah, okay. All right, thank you for your time. Good morning, how y'all doing? Great. 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 All right, so because we all have gravy on our stomachs, and I am fighting my God from Zion to just stand up here and walk. Um, now, I do have on sandals. I stubbed my toe trying to move tables this morning, so I just could, I just didn't feel God in those shoes. And I felt him in the slides, and I want to exemplify how Jesus walked when he walked there. Amen. <laughs> We're going to start off. First, I want to say, Welcome. Welcome to this session. I'm not going to tell you what the session is, what we're going to do with this session. We'll talk about it after we get through with this activity, okay? So what I need from everyone is for there to be a table of three at each table. A table of three. The end is getting a sheet of paper, and this is what we're going to do. Each person is going to have... 15 seconds, no, 20 seconds, to write or complete what the person before them has written. We're going to write a story, okay? Whatever they say, you just need to come up with something to complete it, okay? It can be anything. And we're going to start off with 20 seconds. Yes, write for 20 seconds. And with 20 seconds, I'm going to say next, you slide the sheet of paper down, and you use that pen, and you start writing. And it's going to be quick. I'm going to say next, slide, pen, go. 20 seconds countdown. And then when it gets to that third person, or fourth, when it, well, when it gets to the third, we're going to shift to the fourth. The time is going to shoot from 20 to 7 seconds. Okay? And you have to write whatever it is, just complete it, and keep it going. Okay? And at the end, we're going to read these stories. Okay? Oh, this is going to be fun. All right, here we go. 
on your march. <laughs> See, you usually don't say this unless march. you work with kids. March. March. You march. No, march. We say march. Come on. This is Alabama. Come on. <laughs> don't do that, Justin. <laughs> on your mark. <laughs> ah, march it on up. Get set. Go. Get back to the person at the beginning. And we're going to go around and we're going to read these stories. All right. Let's go. Table one. Hold on. Hold on. Who are you telling? Because this one's picking blueberries. I don't know what they're playing from the blackberries. Here we go. Blackberry. All right, here we go. Listen up. During the time of a child, I would dream of princes and kings and queen. I would be all the while singing, singing the hills are alive with the sound of music. The wonderful sound of the melodic would bring strangers out to rejoice. On their trip to Dubai, they dreamed of being the... What? what? Wow. Don't pull for no novel. <laughs> In Georgia, the weather is unpredictable and crazy, and we are ready for a time of fun. The children went happily to the car in excitement for the day's festivities. We're on our way to Six Flags, and Justin got scared when we got to the top. I I'm going to get some money. My name is in the book. Yeah. All right, all right, You'll see. Read. This is the same Read it. Just read it. Over 3,000 years ago, on a hill called Liberty Calvary, the kids were saved by Jesus' sacrifice. His life so that they could live. Amen. The Lord is good. Watch out for the snakes. I was almost bitten by an elephant posing <laughs> as a... All I wanted was blackberry cobbler. <laughs>
Tell me what did you get from that activity? What, what, what did you get from that activity? And I want to use your paper real quick, okay? What did you get from this activity? Awesome. Who else? We all play a part. Yes. Who else? That we can finish a, a thought. Yes. We can carry a thought on. Yes. Yes. Come on. We're tapping into it. Yes. We can build on the ideas of others. Yes. We're going there. Let's go. Quick thinking, yes. Um, somebody may start it, but you may be the one to finish. Oh, one, one, He's still one, trying to preach on this morning. Oh, 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 my God! Where's it all All right. Well, give him a dollar. Give him a dollar. Yeah. Woo! That was right. That was good. That was good. For your report. I want y'all to look at this. What's different? What, 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 what's different about this? What do you see? Three separate thoughts. What else? Different handwriting. What else? Where it's written at. Once. Right, alignment. Different colors. Right. But when you read it, did you know that? No. All you heard was the what? The story. And the way that we got to the story is because we opened up our creativity. Everyone had to bring themselves to the story. Mm -hmm. And when you bring yourself to the story, no matter what kind of pen you're using, no matter what type of font that you have, you have to figure out how I'm going to add to what somebody else has done. Mm -hmm. And the way that you add to what somebody else has done, you have to bring yourself to the table. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important for us to have creativity and use creativity? Because when you use creativity, you use what God did. What did he do in the beginning? He said, in the beginning, God what? Created. Creativity was here before we were even formed. Look at chapter 1 in Genesis. It said he created man and woman. He created them in his image. Chapter 2 talks about him forming us. That's when the breath of life came into us. But we were created. Creativity, the power to speak and things happen, was already in place, prepared, waiting for us to be formed. So when you use creativity, you are allowing the essence of God to be used because you're using yourself. You're using what he's putting you. And I tell people, when I'm able to be myself, God can flow 100% through me. Yeah. Why? Because I'm using what he gave me. And when you limit me, you limit the movement of God Amen. through me. This was a great example because nobody fussed. Nobody said, I can't do it. You just started thinking, mm -hmm. how can I add? to what was already placed in front of me. Mm -hmm. And because there was a time limit, sometimes we don't use, time sometimes is a great thing because it makes us have to work even harder. Mm -hmm. And when you knew that time limit, you said, great, let me start thinking, let me start moving. When it comes to ministry, you have to have creativity. Mm -hmm. You have to be open, you have to be quick on your toes. And when you begin to say, I cannot do it, you just stump yourself and you stump the movement of God working through you. Mm -hmm. So when I said welcome, welcome what? Welcome to your free, your ability to be free as thinkers. When you leave today, your mind should be enthused, energized to be thinkers, to be creative, because we all are creative individuals. How? Look at what's happening in technology today. I have an iPhone 6S Plus. That came out in what, November, <laughs> October? Last year, there was another one, iPhone 6. And before that, there was iPhone 5. They are, they're always thinking. Apple is always thinking of the next best thing. When we have what they just put out, trust me, there's somebody else thinking of something else probably here ahead of us because they're constantly moving. They're constantly using the creativity that God gave them. If Apple can think of it, why cannot the church? Amen. Because when you open up, you see another side of God. Whether it's adding on to a story or coming up with another method to making something work. So this is what I want to say about this presentation today. Be not afraid. Everyone say be, be not, not afraid. afraid. This is our problem. When it comes to technology, when it comes to new things, when it comes to stretching out, when it comes to thinking, we begin to get afraid because we don't know how it's going to turn out. We don't know what's going to happen. Because of our life and things that have let us down, we allow fear to step in 
And if I'm not mistaken, my Bible says God has not what? Given us the spirit of what? Fear. So when fear arises, there should be the indication that greatness is on the other side. Because if that thing wasn't really going to stop, why are you trying to keep me from it? So when you think about T.D. James, guess what his biggest fear was? Talking in front of people. He would sweat crazy. He would stutter. He couldn't get his words out. But what if he would have allowed being afraid and being fearful to be in his life and not be creative? He would not be making the impact that he is to the world. So be not afraid. Being leaders and being in this church, we're going to talk about this ministry, you have to be open and be creative. Everyone has an ability to be creative. When I think about Alabama, I think about how nifty we are. Our friend is duct tape, electrical tape, what my kids say, the gray stuff. We would use that for anything. We would use it on a car and just paint over it, and you couldn't tell as long as we're driving by. You think it's a just straight up clean until you get close to it. You think about ways of, of making a fan. You think about way, do, doing things and making stuff for it. They always say, back in the days, they said if you had bread, water, and ketchup, you knew how to make some type of meal. You know how to make that some sauce. There was ways of making it. But what I'm challenging you today is, when you look at greater community, how, how advanced are we? How, are we really using our creativity in these ministries? Are we adding to the ministries that we have here in this church? Because I want us to be like the next Starbucks, the next Apple, the next Windows, always thinking about how we can draw more people and get more people to convert. Because that's what Apple keeps doing. They keep converting their stuff to bring in new clients. Now Verizon, Sprint, AT&T, they've got this new thing where if you come, you'll get a new iPhone. They keep doing things of letting them know this is what we're going to do so you can come over to us because it's better over here. we got better signal. Why can't we come up with a plan like that to convert people to Jesus Christ? Because it is better over here. You just have to try it. And I don't know if y'all saw the Super Bowl when they had um, Steve Harvey. And he came out and said, it's not him. There's a commercial about Verizon. And they use these balls saying that they have the better service. Well, T-Mobile came out. And all their balls were pink. And they just kept rolling. Steve Harvey said, hold up, hold up, hold up. It's not me this time. <laughs> Verizon, I mean, Verizon got it wrong. They said that uh, T-Mobile wasn't this. That was the old network. But they really have the best network. And, you know, Steve Harvey, thinking about so coming out. It was fun. It really made me rethink about it. Because I'm like, hmm, just that thought. All we need to give people is that moment to just think about it. And if you consistently keep pushing that thing, they'll say, okay, let me try it on. Let me just see how it is so that I can try to convert you to us. So be not afraid. Why should we not be afraid? Because when we're not afraid, we open up your creativity. Today we're going to do that. And the one thing that we're going to talk about today, and this word is scary for a lot of people. This is no shade, but this is I get it from a lot of <clears throat> the saints who, who are older than me, when they see this right here, they get scared. <laughs> I can't do it. I tell the kids, when you say you can't do it, you would never do it. Life and death lies in the what? Power of your tongue. If you speak it, you will not. Now, here's the thing. If you go and say, I'm going to do it, you have to understand I'm going to be my creative self. So I may not do it the way that it's, it needs to be done or the way that you're showing me. But as long as I get it done, that's all that matters. Before my grandmother passed, she would have her phone and she would text like this. And I'd be like, child, use your fingers. I can't do that. She said, do you want me to respond to you or do you not? I want you to respond. So let me hold it the way I'm going to hold it. Use my finger, whatever finger. Because if she got mad, she would use the other finger while she texting. And I was like, all right, I'm going to leave you alone. And she would change fingers. So she would use it, but she would get it done. When we're in our group text, she would be delayed with her laughter because she want to make a full sentence. But she still responded because she 
said, I'm going to be me in this. Yes, I understand how they do certain things, but let me do it the way that I feel comfortable right, right. and I can get it done. And you know what? But I, and I love you saying, let me do it the way I feel comfortable and don't let your mind say, I'm not even going to try it. But I do say, at least try it. Yeah. And if you say you can't, say, okay, let me try it this way, but let me just get it done. And when it comes to technology, when that word comes up, oh, I can't, oh, I don't know that. No, you do. And you have the ability because the scripture says, I can do what? All things. The scripture says, I can do all things. The same ability to speak and say, let there be light. You have that same ability to speak and things change. So why can't we tackle certain things like technology? That same ability to get up and speak over your children, you can have the same ability for yourself. But when it comes to ourselves, we tend to slide back. My principal will be here tomorrow speaking. I asked her to write her bio. It was the hardest thing. As a doctor, one of the smartest people I know. But when it came to speaking about herself, she couldn't do it. And to me, that seems, that's kind of a problem because then it suggests that do you really believe in yourself? Because, because our culture, don't talk about, don't put, no, I'm going to tell you this is what I'm good at. This is what I know how to do, and I'm going to let you know just, if, just so you won't ever assume and if you ever need help with something, you know that person knows how to do it because that's what they said. So as we get deeper into this, <clears throat> technology is the new upper room. What does that mean? Tell me what you think that means. One accord in one place? Go a little bit more. The way everybody communicates in my entire world. Come on. Okay. <laughs> We're tapping into it. Come on. It brings, it's what brings us together. Yes. Uh, it's that place where we can meet and uh, make this common, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. What else? <clears throat> we can be fed church. through it. We can be fed through it. Okay. Are you saying you have to live as a like, heaven? Like, like, in the context of when... So, so, so. They prayed on the day of Pentecost. They came to what they called the upper room, an area, all different. That's how all different people came together. They began to pray, and then that's when the Holy Spirit dropped. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. I think it eliminates geographical, physical uh, distances. Uh, it, it eliminates that because it's all electronic. Right. Yes. I was going to say technology. You can think of technology as a new translator. Ah, that's good. Now you trying to freeze, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See what you do? I know, there's oil in people. You can fry some chicken on them, yes. <laughs> the virtual church, yes, the virtual church. How many of you on you ever tried you stream? I love it, oh my God. When you go to Bedside Baptist, that thing blesses your soul. Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm saying, technology is the new upper room. Why? Because you can talk and reach anybody across seas in that same moment that you're having here in creative community. Yes, there are bad ways and bad things about it, but there are also great things. And I, I do get frustrated when people talk more about the bad things, but don't look at it for the good things. Because if that was be the case, we should not be working in the jobs that we're working, but some of the people we work with are bad people, but it does not change you. I have to pull out the good so that I can continue on that mission for my life. Technology open. As technology does this sometimes. <laughs> it does. It does. Come on, Holy Ghost. Does somebody, anybody using the Wi-Fi? I am. Did it just go out? Oh, never mind. Mine went out. And sometimes technology does do that. What is that password? Um, GC Kojic underscore 406. All uppercase. And we're going to get into Wi-Fi in a second as well. Doing great on time. So it's the new upper room. And the piece that you always hear pastors saying, if we want to reach this generation, we want to reach the millennial, we have to be tech savvy. How do, what's one simple way? And this is how I tell people. You, our five areas of evangelism, let's call them out. We have social, social, social. social which is... Social is us having a 
than the theater. It's like a gathering, a social time with our friends, going out, inviting everybody out to dinner, um, going to a play, going skating, ice skating, those type of where you can experience the love of Christ through me while having fun. So that's social. Another one. Family. What's that? <laughs> Evangelizing to your family. Right. It's simple. It's simple. <laughs> What's the next one? Marketplace. Marketplace. What's marketplace? Work. School. All right. What's next? Small E. Small E is what? Electronic. Electronic evangelism. That is Facebook, social media, Ustream. What's the last one? Kindness. Woo! Come on. And what's kindness? Just being nice. Being nice. Do you know that you can use all five of our areas of ministry in a matter of 30 seconds? Do you know that? And you can still be in the bed. With your jammies on. <laughs> and your footies. <laughs> oh, you can. You want to know how? Through technology and social media. Everyone say this number. 140. 140. That's how many characters you use on Facebook. Facebook is a little bit more. Twitter, Instagram, you can, the main number of characters you can use is 140. And 140, you can communicate with anybody throughout the world. On Facebook, you can be nice. You can put a scripture. You can tell them about your life story. You can encourage them. You can invite them out somewhere all in one post. You can cover five areas, and you're still in your bed. Because I tell our millennials, you may not go to house to house knocking on doors and giving out tracts. That's one way. Another way that they can do it while they're on their phones, using social media as a point of evangelism. Because that's one way. So my thing is, if you can't evangelize in 140 characters, you're not using your creativity that God has given you. And if you don't, and now, this is where I may get a little pushback. If we are evangelists and we're, we want to reach the world and we want to reach millennials and we want to see God's word be expanded, I do think that everyone should have one main stream of technology to reach the people. Whether it's on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, text messages, radio, some way, somehow, there should be some type of reach that you have in you to reach the people. Because this is where... This is where life is right now. Everything that's happening on the White House that they do, I'm right there in that moment. And I can be a part of it. People from down where we talking about, what was the two countries that could not be a part of Kojic, Jamaica? Trinidad. Uh, Trinidad. Trinidad. That shuts all that out now. Because they can be a part of our services, convocations, have everything. There are so many churches now. Buckhead Church is one of the churches with Andy Stanley. They have, I think, up to nine churches here in Atlanta. Do you think he touches every last one of them? No. They go in, they have worship. When it's time to preach, they pull down a screen, and there he is. Giving the word of Christ while he's in one location, he's touching nine other co communities here in Atlanta. And so, well, I'm not used to that. That's cool. But look at what it's doing. And if that's going to allow us to reach to win souls, then by God, let pull down the screen, get pastor up there, and then let's sit down, let's hear the word of God. Amen. Because the end result is we want your soul saved. Yeah. And if it's 140 characters, if it's me putting a screen out there, we want your soul saved. So if it means me coming out my shell to really get some type of social media account so that I can minister to my children, minister to my friends that I probably used to, I used to grow up with, minister to my old coworkers, ministering to my um, school members where I graduated from. Because now I'm able to see most of my school, they've gotten saved and they started families. I'm able to see that. And now I'm ministering to them just by my page. So I encourage people. I say, hey, make sure you're part of social media. Because that's how we're winning. And we're going to win people. We started a virtual church here at the church. It's Generation Virtual Church. And it cuts out all the excuses. So I ain't got nothing to wear. That's okay. Well, y'all stay in church too long. That's all right. Well, y'all too far. It is okay. Do you have a phone? I do. Do you have a computer? I do. Do you have an iPad? I do. 
Here it is the website, turn it on. There's everything. Worship, word, you got a conversation, you got um, talk show, you got motivational, and you can watch it when you want to, you can pause it when you get busy, and you can come back to it. All right, it's church right there on your phone. And some people say, oh, well, I'm not used to that. That's cool. But opening up my creativity allows me to think of other ways that people can reach God. And some would never come to this sanctuary. And that is okay. If my computer and us posting it is getting your soul saved where you're able to go to your marketplace and minister by God, and let's do that. Because at the end of the day, we want our souls to be saved. So now the challenge is, how creative have you been here at Greater Community? What have you added to the table? Because if you would have missed a portion of us doing this, a story would have had a gap in it. And we would have been wondering, what's next? What's happening? If you didn't bring your, the way of writing, you would never be able to have to, you know what I'm saying, start a conversation. Hey, what did you mean by that? Oh, I meant that that started a conversation. That started us being able to say, okay, what did that mean? Oh, yeah, that is what that meant. Cool, well, let me add on to that. When you bring yourself, you bring God to the table because he's able to work freely through you. So, let's talk about the challenges and the opportunities of technology. What are some of the challenges? It doesn't work all the time. Anymore. Hello, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work all the time. What else? It's impersonal. It's impersonal, okay. Stay learning. Huh? It requires you to keep learning. Yes, God. And that's a stretch. But some don't like to read. Amen. I don't. Amen. Stay current. Staying current, yes. We could become a crutch. Oh my, come on. Because you know now, they don't, kids don't write in cursive anymore. Mm -hmm. And they think they are projecting within the next five years, five to ten years, that there will be very limited use of paper and pencils. It's more iPads, computers, phones, electronics. electronics. When I had a second grader pull out his phone, they called his mom. Pulled out the flip phone, dialed the number, started talking. We couldn't get in touch with him. He's sitting over there just chatting with him. And I'm like, <laughs> so he's like, my mama, give us the phone. You knew the number? <laughs> and then when I was dialing wrong, you missed it. You supposed to match that button. He's in second grade. He's seven years old. Technology. Yes. Say it again. Yes, virtual books for school. That's a blessing because it's cheaper. Thank Hello, you. somebody, yes. And you have more access to it because I remember my school, you had to leave the books there. And I, and I was like, listen, if the book is here, my mind is staying with the book. I'm not going home to read. I'm just not. Yes. I was going to say, um, okay, come back. Okay. That's technology. Challenges, yes, that's a challenge. So, opportunities. Here we go. Y'all still have that piece of paper? No, you took mine. Oh, I did. That's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it is. So here we go. For the next for the next 10, 15 minutes, your table. Come up with the name of your group, your table, whatever it's going to be. But I want you to come up with an opportunity that we can create here that will kind of help with some of the challenges or provide a new opportunity with, with using technology. Come up with some opportunity that overcomes one of the challenges that we spoke about that we can use here at Greater Community or come up with a new opportunity that we can add here to greater community using technology. Because this is stuff that we're going to present to pastors say, this is what we came up with. Think outside the box. Use the people at your table and come up with something. Okay? One more time, come up with an opportunity that overcomes one of the challenges that we just stated using technology or come up with a new opportunity that we can create here at greater community using technology.
And as you are writing it, please write down what you're saying, what the person next to you is saying, what the third person is saying, so that we can make sure everyone's part of the conversation. And we'll have 15 minutes to do that. And then we'll be done. And we what? We will think of being a part of Great Community. We're going to start with y'all table. Let's go. Everyone listening? One minute. Hold on. Oh, hold on, hold on. All right, here we go. All right, so we tried to come up with a unique name for the group. We came up with Smiths. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a couple of opportunities that we um, came up with. Um, is streaming like the at night, the at night uh, services. So streaming like streaming the ignite services. So just like we would stream service in the sanctuary, we stream the ignite services because you aren't youth aren't necessarily going to tune in to see see older uh, older adults. Uh, also having um, have the ability to have a nursery where if you're doing nursery, you're you're still able to take part in the services where you have um, TV monitors that tap back into yeah, your stream. Really uh, being able to watch services when you're working here as a, men yeah, as a yeah, member yeah. of the kitchen staff. Love it. Uh, it's came up with um, a mock production studio because as the church advances, you're gonna need people that, are gonna be, that need to be trained to do this. So if you set up a mock production studio where you, you bring youth in or just anyone that's interested, and have them train on the equipment that you need in place. You see who's interested in it, who's not interested in it. But as you're training them, you're getting them ready for the next stage that we're heading to. Uh, also, tech workshops. Uh, as technology I take his advances, minute up. <laughs> I do too, because he's taking his minute up. Yeah, it is. I was getting my clock so it go off. <laughs> so I wouldn't be rude. So I wouldn't be rude. While you get your clock, <laughs> one last one, which is a, um, a youth advisory board of sorts where they let they let the church know what technology youth is being is is currently using so that we can train we can train people about those technologies. Also, also the allegedly table. <laughs> <laughs> to teach individuals instead of in groups. This would be a way of people not feeling intimidated or afraid of using technology. Since we have an older population at GCC who have a wealth of knowledge and experience to share. Also, I, it was on. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
<laughs> no, that, that was not really, that was set up for the next group, because the other one was quiet. That was good, because I love that IT help that. Yeah. They get a group of people to do that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 Creativity step then. Yeah, <laughs> Go ahead. We are the greater three. And <laughs> we are the greater three. <laughs> We, uh, these are our opportunities uh, uh, for creating and bridging and these quick ideas for using blast text, which we kind of incorporate in some of our departments, uh, but creating learning labs for the use of technology um, where people come and learn together. Um, uh, and then the point was brought up about people not necessarily having access, so in this age of constantly upgrading and getting rid of stuff, Maybe we create a, uh, a drive where we donate our old phones and gadgets where other people can you know, come up to, I mean, it'll be old, but it'll still work, so. <laughs> uh, we need to create an app for our church. Yes. Everything is app-driven now. Yes. Um, and we, we thought about using our young people to teach older people because it creates the gap, uh, an opportunity for them to be together right. and learn together. That's good. Y'all redeemed y'all stuff from that story. All along with the technology training, um, and everyone has said that so graciously, we are uh, doctors and angels over here. <laughs> <laughs> and we would like everybody to be uh, able to access technology and taking king community to the kingdom to... You know, that. Kingdom to King, yeah. We're trying to bring kingdom to community. If we were able to provide training for our community and, uh, and pulling in some partners that may be able to donate devices and training, um, having individuals be able to upgrade. You know, you come in, you show that you're vested. And we give you this stuff to take home and internet service along with it. Um, when you prove that you're vested, we can swap out your desktop for a laptop just to keep them coming here, the community coming here. Mm -hmm. And while they're here, they need to eat a little some natural yeah. food and some spiritual yeah. food. Yeah. Um, and being able to provide services like uh, job placement, job fairs, uh, using technology to apply for jobs, GED online, college apps, <laughs> financial aid, all of that stuff on site so that people will come from community to, to the kingdom. To the kingdom yeah. And then, we reach the total man, and that's on. part of our mission statement. <laughs> so we are the three preachers. Is that an open plate over there? And uh, I'll just say the ideas that haven't been spoken. The first one is power in the pews. We would like it to the pews to have electricity so you can uh, recharge. Come on, phone. God is speaking in the air. Text on. your tithe. Charge your phone. To be able to just send a text with your tithe. Thank you. Get the kiosk or uh, repaired or replaced and put some uh, screens in the sanctuary. And then have a moment in the message where pastor just says, tweet this, and everybody tweets it. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Reverend, I have a question. What do you mean to text your tithe? What does that mean? Text your tithe? Text your tithe. There's a, a program that a lot of churches are starting to use uh -huh. where you can literally just text a number and it'll you can text your type to yeah. the offering um, yeah, the finance committee. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think what happens is there has to be a prior um, set, set up, up at home okay. and so then you always can do that anyway. Okay. Yeah. Alright, here we go. For one minute is starting. Yeah, I know the previous table just mentioned it um, just now, but I do think that screens would be very beneficial. I know coming from a, um, a, a music department standpoint, it helps to get the audience engaged if you have uh, encouraging words to get their mindset ready for worship. Um, yeah, we don't really have much. We, ha uh, we also have a greater corner. 
You know how when you go to a conference and they'll ask, uh, you know, how did you enjoy the conference? What did you get out of it? Uh, I understand that great community and uh, also MLB Ministries has a lot, of, a lot of followers and that's just another way for them to get engaged with what's going on here at Greater Community. I was even telling John about that house. People are watching you stream and they're um, getting, you know, they want to know about us. Another thing we noticed that uh, when you want to know something, you go to YouTube, right? Right. Is Greater there? Yes. yes. We are. Yes. How, how often? I mean, is it always? We're not updated. We need to keep that going. Yeah. yeah. Bless so glad. Bless us all. You can report it to me. I watch all the time. Is that all on all time? Hey, here we go. We be the FTP gang. All right. Good boy. Frederick Trish Oville. Oh. What's the gang side? That's the gang. What's the gang side? FTP. I think I started that little. I'm ready for that one. Okay. Okay. Um, talking about team connection, trying to keep our young folks interested, and you know they get tired of hearing old folk talk all the time, and we need to find a way. I was a youth pastor for many years, and the one way we can do is to use, uh, have them come in with their technology, and they can bring their musical instruments in to a place like this once a week. They can bring their poetry writing, and they can start making things up on the internet, all kinds of wonderful outreach evangelistic things. And then when they go back to school and say, hey, I'm getting to play my guitar at church, and I'm getting to write things, and we're making a movie, whatever, they're going to bring their friends in. So now we got immediate evangelism going on. And then when they create whatever they create, they can actually present it to the general church population and they will feel like they're a part. Mm -hmm. So let's get them off the kitty table, that Thanksgiving table, and let's get them into the church. Uh, wonderful, right. wonderful. Can we give everybody a hand? <laughs> so here we are. So this is where we leave off. This is where we end this. Because we're going to do two things. Everything you said was great. I'm taking those papers and I'm going to think through one. How can we can start implementing that? One, I know through the college and career ministry, because we're always open. But here's the challenge. Here is the push. All the ideas that you said, now think, how can I add this to this community? Add this to this church? Is this an idea that I can bring to my ministry? Who do I need to talk to? Because one thing about creative people, some of them, they just think. They can't execute. Mm -hmm. But, and that's cool. You think it, we'll work it. You know, that you just have to know your place. But we need y'all's thoughts in these conversations, being a part of these ministries, because everything you said is great. Some of the stuff I've never, I, I didn't even think about. And while you're talking, I'm getting excited because all I'm hearing is other ways to reach more people. And that's where my excitement comes in that. And when, like I said, when you do that, you're opening space for God to give you more ideas on how you can bring more people to his kingdom. So as I take this information, we begin to use it. When you hear these things coming up, sign up for it, assist and help. And this is what I need you all to pray. Pray that we begin to get the finances because I... We are a great church, but I want companies to start sowing into this ministry. I went to the epicenter. Well, what's the name of the church? It's Word of Faith. Word of Faith. Word of faith. Blown away. Bowling alley. Rock climbing. Lounge. They're connected to a community center, and they have their own spa. They have their own workout center. They have a subway. They have a food station up. All of Wendy's is right in front of them. It's, it's constantly moving, constantly going. And my thinks, my thoughts when I rolled up in there, what do we need to do to get this to happen? Who do we need to connect with? And I do believe when we get the creative minds together, we begin to pray into what we're seeing and what we're prophesying over this ministry, God will begin to connect us with the people that have the resources. That's my prayer is that we begin to get the resources and begin to get the people to make it happen. Because now all of these ideas, especially the IT, especially with um, doing uh, YouTube, we need people to demand that. Because now we're growing so big, we don't, and Pastor keeps saying, we don't have enough hands to do it. So we need other people to just come be a part. And this is the thing, if you don't know it, just like they didn't know how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich, there will be people there to teach. We just need you to have a willingness to serve. And if you have a willingness to serve, we'll begin to cover these areas that have holes to where our challenges diminish and more opportunities are created here in this ministry. So I'm going to pray us into this thing.
I don't want you to just believe God with me as I begin to pray, because this is what I'm going to pray, that the creativity open in you, that whatever God has called you to, you begin to walk powerfully in that every single day. Every day you should be doing what God has called you to do. And if you're doing that, pray that he opens up the creativity so that I can do it in multiple ways. Because if you are being you and you bring that you to this ministry, we're going to win people. But if you're not following that gift, that thing that calls you powerfully, each and every day you are missing people that are hungry. And we're walking by people that are hungry because we have not acknowledged what he has in my life. And I can't give them that gladness that we read about the first time we had cattle. So y'all ready to pray into what we are expecting God to do in this year for this ministry? Because I do believe we can make some connection in this year. Does anybody believe that? Because I want to make sure you believe that. So let's bow our hands. And as I'm praying, I want you to be praying and speaking over this because I believe today starts this thing. I believe that things are going to open for us because we're thinking creatively and we're asking what God has placed in us. To begin to manifest what's happening spiritually, manifest naturally. Because it says, eyes have not seen, ears haven't heard, neither to the hearts of man. But he has revealed it unto our spirit. So now take what you've revealed to us. Now take what you've written on these pieces of paper. Now let's make that natural. Now let's give us the strength to be able to do it. Father God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this class. We thank you for these individuals. We thank you for being a creative God. We thank you for being a loving God and a giving God. We thank you for giving us the power, God, to know who you are and the power to know who you are on the inside of us. Now now we pray and we decree that resources yes, shall come yes. unto this church. God, resources and money shall come to this church so that we can effectively evangelize through technology, through other streams, God, to create opportunities for souls to be saved, for lives to be changed, for bodies to be healed, God. It can be done, but we're calling on you, God, because you've already provided everything that we need. So now we pray that the favor of you be upon our lives so that we can connect with people who can do us a favor, God. Allow your favor, God, to run into somebody who needs something to donate to. Run into people that have the resources and the money and the labor, the people that want to Give their time to this ministry, God. We call it forth now in the name of Jesus. We decree and we declare that the creativity in our lives be open, God. That our mind be expanded. That our mind be stretched, God. So that we can see you better. We can experience you better in what you call for us to do, God. You've given us a gift. Now allow us to work that gift in this ministry, God. Allow us to take that gift to our job. Take that gift to our families. Take that gift to social media. Meeting God, take that gift everywhere we go, God. Yes. So we're asking that the creative God speak, God, the creative God do, the creative God be able to do exceedingly and abundantly and above all we can ask or think. So we expect bigger now because we're asking for it. We expect bigger now because we're believing you for it. You said now unto him who is able to do it. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly, God. So we thank you for it, God. We bless you, but I bless you for every soul that's in this class on today, God. Because today you let us know that you're waiting on us to ask you, how can I expand my thinking? How can I be better at what you've given me to do? How can I think and be open to change, God? Because you are a God that has so much. And we've only tapped into just the surface of who you are. Allow us to see you more. Allow us to experience you more, God. Don't let us get caught up in tradition and culture to where we're missing a move, missing a time where you want to rain your glory down on our lives, God. So here we are, God, rain down the creativity, rain down the resources, rain down the provision, God, because you are Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. So we extend our hands. We, we, we open up our hearts and we say, here we are, let us receive it. Here we are, God, let us receive it, the strength to do, God. The ability to make it happen, God. Some of our own jobs is not allowing them to do what they need to do, God. We pray that you open up the doors, God, so that they can do their gifts, God. That ways can be made, God. We want to do what you've given us to do, God. So either change us out of that job, God, or change that job while we're in it, God, because that's what we do. We are you, God. And if it does not look like what you put in us, God, change it, God, because we want you to walk freely in our lives, God, in the name of Jesus. So here we are. Here we are, God. 
And we stand, thank you, Jesus. We stand in expectation, God. And we know that it's getting ready to happen, God. It's getting ready to happen in our lives. It's getting ready to happen in this ministry because we believe you, God. And we know, God, the eyes haven't seen, God. Ears haven't heard, God. Neither is into the hearts of men what you're getting ready to do. But you have revealed it unto our spirits. So we rejoice, God, because we know that it's getting ready to happen. If you believe it, open up your mouth, clap your hands, and give God praise for what's getting ready to happen in this ministry. Hallelujah. If you believe it, it's getting ready to happen, come on. Praise God for that. Hallelujah! 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 Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! I'm telling you, it's getting ready to happen in this ministry. Stay on what you had today. Be, when you feel yourself being stumped, when you feel yourself like you can't push, begin to sit back and say, what do I need to do to get around this thing? And when you do that, you will see God give you wisdom on how to make it happen, or he'll bring somebody to you to pull you out of it. Don't think that you're stuck. Just say, God, here's the point of creativity. Now give it to me so that I can move and get to what you called me to do. If you believe it, come on, clap hands and give God a praise.